Test, test. Okay, cool. Um, this should be interesting. It's been a while since uh, I've been to a real event. Um, though I guess I kind of look at like this these days with a, you know, a little sparse audience and a lot of people on the internet. Um, I think we've all gotten a little too comfy sitting at home instead of going and meeting people, but you know, it's fun. Um, cool. So, you know, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks people for dialing in. Uh, I'll try to make this entertaining. Uh, I'm not going to provide any value. So just spoiler. Uh, what I wanted to do is kind of set this up for everybody else today. I'm very bullish on the authenticity of Century's brand uh, and us really keeping it true to who we are and what the world is. And so, you know, ultimately, you take nothing away from this. That's okay. And that's probably a pretty good intro to the, the point of this talk. Uh, Century can't fix that either. Um, but let's talk about that. So why, why does it say Century can't fix this? What is the purpose of that? Uh, hopefully you've seen our billboards. Uh, they are not free. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully they stand out. You might often ask, what the hell is going on with this billboard? What does this have to do with Sentry? It's good. That's exactly what our goal is with those kinds of things. Your marketing team is probably like, why would they waste money on this? I don't know. You should go talk to them. Maybe you need a better marketing team. Um, but this is brand advertising, right? And the thesis behind this is like, like kind of create awareness. Like, get people to ask questions like, what is that? What's going on? What is Sentry? Things like that. And, and if you'll notice, this is not the current one. Um, but what this actually depicts is a minotaur, um, which is not a real animal, if you're not sure. Uh, and it is playing uh, VR. Makes no sense. That's the purpose, right? And so Sentry can't fix that. There's nothing to fix. That's true with a lot of things we're going to talk about today. Sometimes it's fine. Sometimes we need to fix it. Um, but that's kind of where we start. And so to really kick that off, I want to dial back time to my early days, uh, and, and so everybody knows and there's no confusion, I'm in my late 30s. Um, so I'm not old, even though I feel it, but I'm also not young. So hopefully most people know what I'm talking about, and it's not too foreign of a concept, but uh, memory lane. So I don't know if anybody recognizes these things. Uh, you know, I came up in the era where we had the baggy jeans, like the elephant pants. Jinko was a big brand. Most importantly, we had Furbies and the original iPod, but early 2000s. And this era was hugely influential on me, and I actually like to believe this is kind of the key to the start of what is modern internet. Like, it's not necessarily the dot-com boom connected, but it's sort of the technology path that brought us to where we are today. And for me, one of the most important things about this time was Blink-182. And if you know me, uh, you might think I'm the greatest Blink-182 fan of all time. I'm not really. I just latch on to the idea because it's fun now. But why this is such an important memory for me is because as soon as I got a computer, the first thing I did was download Blink-182 uh, Blink MP3s. Uh, yes, it's illegal. Sue me. Please don't, but you can. Um, but this mattered because I come from a working class family. I didn't have access to money a lot of times. I barely managed to get access to a computer, but the internet made this accessible. Whether it's right or wrong, it made it accessible, right? I was able to access those MP3s. Uh, and I was actually able to access many other things. And that's why this era of the internet is so important to me. It was kind of lawless. It was like open, the Wild West. Like, there was no GDPR. Like, there's, there's no, like, giant corporations running every website in the world, right? It was like a very different world. And that kind of opened my eyes to, like, sort of that, that openness of what, what you could do and the freedom of it and, and, even more importantly, how simple everything was, right? There was, like, a lack of complexity. And I think the actual real important thing of that era was PHP. Still important today, of course, but if you're in San Francisco, you might just think nobody uses PHP anymore. That's not entirely true in just the world we live in. Um, but I got my start in PHP. And PHP was super powerful because you had an idea, you just wrote the code, it was all embedded, and it just worked. You shipped it, there was no, no deploy, no, no compilation, no complexity, no JavaScript. It was just there and it just worked, right? And I think importantly, the learning curve was like actually very low. Now, Syntax errors were all over the place every time. There were security vulnerabilities like crazy. Uh, I think even PHP shipped with this massive vulnerability by default that every time you wrote a new app, you had to disable called magic quotes. Um, but it was a big deal. And the other thing that I remember from this era is this is kind of when the internet was becoming, in my opinion, like big. And it was bringing on more consumers. 
Uh, and we had a lot more like creativity almost going on in what was happening. And so the other big highlight for me, especially as a gamer, was this is the era of World of Warcraft. And World of Warcraft was interesting because I actually think it brought a lot more people into programming. And it did that because it had this modding scene where you would write Lua and everybody was playing the game. Everybody wanted to make it better. Some people just wanted to find an edge. But it was this massive scene of now Lua developers. And half of these people had no idea what's going on. They're late teens. I was a teenager at the time. But it, 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 it opened the world to just doing this thing. There was no barrier. There was no, you didn't need permission to write mods or anything, right? And it was kind of like PHP. Like, you didn't need permission to go build this stuff. And that was a really important idea. And so, and in fact, I actually, we have folks that we know in the ecosystem from the World of Warcraft modding era, one of whom who works at Sentry these days, which is just, to me, like a crazy idea of this small world from that era and this era, right? Um, but for me, this was important because this was another area where I didn't need permission to do stuff. And the technology was like an open thing for me. And what that looked like in practice is I was reverse engineering like the World of Warcraft sort of file formats and trying to extract information about the game and, and building cool websites out of it. Didn't need Blizzard's permission, didn't need to do anything. Certainly there wasn't an instruction manual, you know, very key of this, this era of the internet. I didn't need to go to a boot camp or to go to a CS program to figure out any of this. You just tried, figured it out, you went with it. That was like such an important idea, um, and spoiler, I think we've lost some of that today. Um, but, but that era of time is just so iconic for me because of how small that barrier was for anybody to get anything done or to, to sort of um, start down that career path, right? And what I remember from it is it looked like a lot like this. You would use SFTP, which is a way that you would take an FTP server, and I realize none of these exist anymore. Um, you would basically mount a remote web server on your desktop, and then you would just go edit the files live. That was your real-time deployment, right? And when you do this, you quickly realize there's problems, like as soon as you have a syntax error, the whole website's erroring. And so what I did is I would just copy the folder of PHP code to a new folder, rename it, and start editing that one instead. And it just worked, right? No deploy processes, no compilation. Uh, now you might say, well, this is, this, of course, yeah, it was bad, code was broken, uh, it wouldn't work if you had 20 people. I mean, the internet was much smaller. We didn't need 20 people to, to build something, right? Um, obviously, I'm still a teenager here. I'm winging it. Not a good idea to do things this way, but again, it was accessible, solved a lot of problems. You were able to get to the finish line. And we built like tangible businesses doing things this way, and that's really important, right? Good luck trying anything remotely as simple as this these days. The other thing that was iconic about that time, which you can actually connect to a lot of what we have these days, is sort of the, the ecosystem and community of tools and products that were available to us. So just like World of Warcraft opened up software to a lot of folks with its Lua modding, MIRC was actually that for me. I got my start and I learned programming through MIRC scripts. And if you're not familiar, MIRC is basically Slack, except it was open source and it was not locked to a company or a single vendor. Um, it's actually still used today, but it's kind of dying, unfortunately. Um, and even when Sentry got its start, we were on IRC. We had a Sentry IRC channel, and that's where a lot of like the, the, the serious people would exist, right? Um, and IRC, to me, is actually one of the most critical things of this generation. Because if you were kind of one of these like internet kids or hackers, right, like you lived on IRC. Like, you would have things uh, as, as PC, as like a Django channel, which is a web framework that we use where you can meet other Django users. You would have your like Dragon Ball Z fanfic channel, whatever you wanted to do there. You'd also have all your wares channels where you could download all your music and, and pirate Photoshop and all these other applications of the era, right? But this was everything. It was everything all in one place. So it was kind of like exposure and it was open, right? And that was such a big deal. But I also remember at the time we had all these other things going on. GeoCities, you could host a free website. You had Fortune City, the same thing. Um, you had tools like Dreamweaver, Fireworks, and Front Page, if anybody remembers those. I think we'd cringe if we tried to use them these days, but they made it accessible, uh, like point and click web pages. Um, but then you also had things like hot scripts, which are interesting because to me, it was kind of open source, but nobody knew what that was at the time, but it was this open way where like, oh, I need, a, I need one of those hit counters on my website, let's go see if there's one on hot scripts that I can install. And you just drop it in your CGI bin and go from there, right? Again, it was like accessible and open, and, um, and I assume hot scripts was a business, but I don't know. It's unclear if they made money or monetized or what it was, but uh, it was just very iconic for me because it was a way to move forward in the career, right? And to, to try new things. And so I think the, the key here is it was welcoming and it's kind of always been welcoming. 
And what I want to talk a lot about today, throughout the day, and push people to think about is, is this still true? And if it isn't, why isn't it? And I would challenge you that it's not necessarily still true today. And it's not about welcoming of like diversity or um, even the, the career ladder of like, do you need a CS degree or anything? It's more that the technology component has become less, less welcoming in technology. The barrier is much higher. And I think what we've done is we've accidentally started gatekeeping technology. Now, we've also intentionally started gatekeeping it with a lot of regulation, some good, some bad, of course. We can't control that. Um, but at the very least, we can look at the technology and make sure we're still making it easy. And that's how I connect this to developer experience, right? Um, OK, so let's see. Good on time. Uh, fast forward a little bit. And as I was doing these, 2010 is a nice round number. This is a little bit earlier, so bear with me. But fast forward you know, a decade or so, five to 10 years. And this, to me, is like the bread and the butter of, of the technology era. So a lot of us probably grew up with the LAMP stack. LAMP, if you're not familiar, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. It eventually grew. It became Python, Ruby, kind of any of these web stacks. But pretty much everything was MySQL of the era, right? And that's actually the important thing. MySQL and some programming language, super accessible, super open source, no barriers, no license fees, right? It was very easy, very easy to get started. Everybody wrote the same thing. PHP had great docs. Like, it, it was just, it was easy, right? And I think the other key thing, and the most critical thing for me in my career, and I think a lot of us probably, was this is the era of Rails. And that became also the era of Django. It enabled the era of other frameworks. And this is really where we went from, here's either eBay writing DLLs in C and putting them on the internet, or here's the PHP file that David Kramer is editing in real time as FTP, to now like, we've got a complicated website. We don't want to download hot scripts, random shenanigans. We need batteries, I guess. You know, Django's philosophy was always batteries included. I think that's a good way to think about that. Um, we no longer wanted to build comments on every website. If it's a blog, we don't want to build the blog. We just use WordPress, right? Like, we didn't want to rebuild every piece of technology because the more you rebuild it, the less you actually evolve, right? And so this was kind of the bridge for me to what we look at today. But this is still very much how I see technology's practice today. It's like, I don't want to solve all the problems at least if I'm being pragmatic about what my goal as a, a product or a business is, right? And for me, at this time, I had joined a company called Discuss. And this is probably the most important time in my career personally, but also because of what was happening in the technology scene. And so there were two key moments that I took from Discuss. Um, and I'll get into those, but if you don't know, Discuss, also a different era. Uh, it was basically a comments widget on a lot of websites. We don't really have comments on websites half the time these days. If we do, it's still probably Discuss, but it's less interactive, right? We all just go to Reddit or something, I don't know, or scroll Snapchat. Um, or I guess TikTok's the new thing. Um, anyways, so Discuss, interesting internet company of the era. This is the era when Dropbox is getting started, when GitHub's getting started. And so it's, it's still early days for a lot of like the startup tech ecosystem of this generation, right? For me, importantly, this is the era of Git, where I had recently learned Subversion, and if you've ever used it, you probably just dread thinking about this era of the internet where branching is hard. You would actually have to, when you created a branch in Subversion, you actually had to annotate the commit log with the commit hash, or the revision ID, I believe it was, of where you branched, or you could not find your way back because it did not actually persist the metadata for you. And eventually they improved that, of course, but it was not a good customer experience. And also, it was like a nightmare to learn these kinds of things. Not that Git is any better, to be fair. It's a big hurdle for people to get involved. Um, but this was when we adopted Git. We moved to Git. And why that's iconic for me is because that's also when a lot of people started understanding code review. Like, maybe if you worked at, like, a mega corp, you already understood this. But I was a startup guy. I was winging it, uh, self-educated. And so for me, all this was new. And so GitHub popularized pull requests and code review via pull request. You know, it was many years later where they actually made it functionally good at code review, but it was still an idea for a way to review code, right? And so such a big deal when you think about back when I was just editing files in real time and like breaking things all the time, right? Code review helped that. It helped make everybody a better developer, kind of an enabler, right? The more important and I think bigger thing that happened in this time for me was learning what testing was. Somehow I had gotten that far. I wasn't that far in my career, but far enough, and I had no idea what tests were. And so I joined Discuss, 
I wrote some code. First week on the job, took down Discuss. And I'm like, huh, how do you avoid that? Oh, you run the tests. Well, it turns out we had a server, like a, literally a desktop computer sitting in the corner of the office for running the tests that was unplugged. It was never used. Maybe it was used at some point, it wasn't used when I was there. And so we had a solution to stop this and to make it easy for people, to enable people to ship code more quickly, we just didn't use it. And what's critical about this period of technology, and this is San Francisco prime days for me, this is when CI and CD became a thing. And I remember going to Python meetups and seeing Yelp and MView, if, if you remember that, like, it was like this 3D avatar company, I still don't understand what it was doing, but they were big pioneers in CI CD. And I latched onto this idea and it's been like pivotal in my career even today. And I think this is like, the CI CD story is what, what I would say developer experience is, fundamentally. It's how do you get the code into production? There's nothing more to software development, it's just how do you get it into production effectively? And so, you know, this was like Hudson, Jenkins, that era of the internet, um, but really a lot of development from a cultural point of view of how do we ship code more quickly, right? And so I became a huge advocate, started driving this at my company, became a, a massive fan of testing just so I was less embarrassed about shipping code when it would go wrong. Uh, and I drove this at a lot of companies, and even today, I still think a lot about this vision of CI CD when we think about Century's roadmap and how that aligns with what we as software developers are trying to accomplish. Um, which side am I on? Okay. That's the, the Hudson and Jenkins logo, if you remember either of those things. I guess Jenkins still used. Um, but we're going to skip this one. And so you might ask, like, why is this so important? Why can't you go back to Microsoft land, take three years to ship a new version of Windows? Well, there's a business reason, of course. But for me, it was like this dopamine hit. It's kind of hard to explain. Maybe it's equivalent of like climbing mountains or doing something dangerous. Like, you like the risk. Oh, this might go bad. This might cause downtime. You want the risk of like, let's just ship quickly. We don't need to test this, let's go. I think that's part of it. I think part of it for me, the dopamine is like, oh, I shipped it to a customer and I get satisfaction out of like, oh, they can use my thing now, right? And I think even if I go back to the World of Warcraft era, and I know for a lot of us, it's like, I liked building gaming websites effectively because I was a gamer and all my friends were gamers. So they would use my stuff. And there's such an immense amount of satisfaction on like people using your stuff, right? It's why Century is a market share driven company. It's not a good business model if you want like a, a fast path to a real business, but it's a satisfying business model because everybody I talk to in the Bay Area uses Sentry. Um, importantly, when you do this, going back to editing things live, you break a lot of things. And so Sentry kind of existed a little bit in this era. It wasn't great, um, but we had an early prototype of it, let's say. But for me, the iconic memory of this era is this moment where I would describe it as fucking Scott. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this guy Scott that I worked with. Um, he was an operations person. And I had this issue where there was a bug in production. The version of Sentry we had at the time was not useful enough that it, it kind of told me what the bug was. We had a customer reporting it, probably, I don't know if Twitter was a thing yet, but tweeting at us or something that was not very useful about this bug. And I spent the better part of a week trying to debug this thing. And so I'm like, oh, I'll add some log statements, right? And I did that. I'm like, okay, I got these log statements. I need to go look at the logs. Scott decided that I should not have access to logs because, I don't know, but um, I could not go to the server. I could not log in. I could not see the logs. He was just not giving me access to them. Uh, Scott probably should not have been employed, to be clear, at that point because his job is not to gatekeep the logs. It's to enable the business and to enable the business we needed to resolve the damn bug, right? And so I have this memory because Scott was a gatekeeper. He was not enabling my goals, let alone the goals of anybody around me. He was just trying to control the outcomes and stop me from doing the thing I wanted to do. Now, you know, the, the, the eye-opening moment was like, oh yeah, Sentry. And this is iconic for me because Sentry enabled me. Like, Sentry was my solution to enable myself to solve the problems I had that day and every day since. So like, I have a new project, I'm basically handicapped, it's like Google Maps, I can't figure out how streets work without Google Maps these days. Sentry is that for me on a new project. If I don't install it, I never even think to consider that the application is broken. Like if Sentry doesn't tell me there's a bug, there's no bugs. It's like the Schrodinger's cat, right? Um, but that was iconic for me because Sentry really helped. And then I started expanding what Sentry could do because I had the power, I had the control. There was no ops person gatekeeping what I could do as an engineer at that point, right? And that's still true today. Like, Sentry is the tool that people use because it's the tool that solves their problem. They don't have to go use some archaic, like, systems admin tool or something like that to get kind of useful information. They just use the tool that's been designed for the purpose. 
and that's open and really tries to help bring that over the finish line. All right, so today. Today is similar but quite a bit different. I think a lot of the same ideas are there, but I think it's gotten a lot more complicated. And I think the, the most iconic thing I can tell you about today is this, that we live in a world of tyrants. And that tyrant's name is JavaScript. It's a very good technology sometimes, but it basically owns everything. And for a lot of us, it causes a lot of pain. It's helped us do some great things, but at like a great cost in some places. And why this matters so much, you might be thinking, you don't need JavaScript. There's a lot of haters in the world, right? JavaScript is the number one segment of software developers in the world, and it has been for quite some time. It's also the fastest growing, and it has been for quite some time. That's important, because if you think, I can avoid JavaScript, you're being very short-sighted about the world. And I think there's a fair question of, like, is JavaScript here to stay? You know, we already have TypeScript, which is an evolution of JavaScript. We, already ha we have these transpilers and ways to convert code. Is there something else? Is WASM going to be a thing, WebAssembly? I don't know. But all I know is today is JavaScript is the most important technology that exists. And so you're going to hear a lot today from JavaScript folks. It's not intentional. It's also not accidental, right? You can't avoid it because it's such an important topic. But let's talk about the problems, right? We talked about how technology was welcoming and how I actually no longer think it's that welcoming. So this is somebody's version of a dependency tree, hopefully not centuries. Um, but if it looks like a nightmare to understand, it's because it is. This is probably the first thing, especially security teams think about when we think about JavaScript, is like, oh, great, NPM. There's going to be 1,000 plus dependencies, maybe wrongly licensed, not licensed at all, so legal's unhappy, probably full of security vulnerabilities, probably three lines of code that somebody's going to inject a backdoor into that, or that already exists, and it's not a fun thing to deal with. Even if you get rid of all that, it's a lot of complexity in, is this going to work? What's it actually doing? Do I need this thing? And you can't control it, because one dependency leads to another 10 dependencies, leads to another 10 dependencies. And it's like this, it's this problem that is not actually a technology problem, but it's a cultural problem, that where we adopted NPM as a, as a solution to like, oh, we can just share lots of code. And it is good at that, but it's kind of gotten overkill. And so this creates a lot of complexity, right? And the, the main thing I want you to take away is the complexity. Because then what this leads to is, you can think about Node.js, but when I talk about JavaScript, you've got to understand that Node.js is actually not that relevant in the grand scheme of things. The reason JavaScript is popular is because browser JavaScript, because of UI, because of front ends, because of single page applications, right? And when your dependency tree looks like this, your loading indicator looks like centuries, and it shows up for quite a long time while it downloads all the JavaScript, right? And so now we've had to resort to technology to try to fix this. Uh, tree shaking is a popular example, to try to stop downloading the JavaScript that we don't need or don't use, right? And it's a very good idea, but it's a problem we created. And sometimes you've got to ask yourself, like, are we taking like two steps back to one step forward? Sometimes it feels like that. I don't know. But that's a big deal. Like the dependency thing, the bundler thing, the fact that you need a bundler, it's a massive barrier to entry. Like you set up a new project and you're sitting here fighting with the bundler for might be two days, right? You don't even write a line of code. Go back to the Rails and Django era. There's no complexity. It just works. It's not all bad, of course. We'll, we'll hear from some folks today who are working on solving this and have built technology to help solve this and make this easier. But it is a big problem in the industry. Uh, and the way I think about this is, it's, you might say it's an uphill battle. Um, you know, if you've been on the hills in San Francisco, some of them are pretty steep. Just imagine, you're, you're going up Knob Hill, you're on a, on a bike, but that hill is like maybe 100 miles long. That's where I feel like we're at in the, in the JavaScript timeline right now. But one of the ideas I want to talk about, so Guillermo's going to be here today talking about Vercel and Next, but Next and ideas like Next are a really interesting approach to this problem. You might just say, oh, it's a framework to write these applications. It's written in JavaScript. And if you're not familiar with Next, um, I'm not a JavaScript guy mostly, so ignore my terminology. But Next is a way to write a single application that renders optimistically both on the front end and back end. So you get fast interactions on the front end, and you get optimized so the back end is doing most of the work, so you're loading less JavaScript at runtime, right? What I like to think of Next as, and this idea, is front-end as a service. And that's a newer concept, but people are talking about it a little bit more. Problem there is the as a service concept, um, because front-end as a service makes sense. We still want to render things so they're, they're accessible by like search engines, by 
people with different kinds of computing devices. So we want to render it on the server sometimes, so we don't need complex computing to render content. Um, but the challenge is these days that I have an API somewhere, or I use Django, or I use some other technology, Java, or whatever, to, to power those APIs. And you can't really replace all of that technology with things like Next, at least not today. And so I think that there's this great use case where we can think of this world as front end as a service, right? UI as a service that happens to also live on the back end. Um, the problem is as a service part, going back to that, because as a service means you've got a service-oriented architecture, which, rewind 10 years ago, only mega companies had these. And they, only the big companies had these because they introduced a huge amount of complexity, right? You now have to deploy multiple services. They have to be in sync. They have to communicate securely with one another. So there's a lot of complexity just for this idea of front end as a service. Even in the local development environment, it's a big complexity, right? And we'll talk about that too. But let's move on from that a little bit. One other interesting thing that has come out of this is JavaScript on other devices. It's not just in the browser. It's on your PlayStation. It's on your TV. It's on your phones. And if you've ever tried to write JavaScript on your phones, for example, you might have tried React Native. I will uh, abstain from having an opinion on React Native, but what I will tell you is most of our customers do not enjoy the experience. Not because the idea is not interesting and good, but because it's so brittle and so hard to achieve success with it. Like you build a project in something like this, you come back in a year and nothing works anymore. There's 15 new versions of everything and upgrading is like a nightmare project on its own, right? And so we've tried to solve some of these things and like innovate on tech, but I think we've too quickly glossed over the flaws in these ideas and we've jumped all the way to the finish line even though the tech is unproven yet or that it's maybe not quite functional yet. And I don't even know if React Native is actually a 1.0 yet, but people ship it to production like very aggressively, right? And there's other versions of this, so people are still trying and I think it's a good effort. Like Flutter is a good example of a newer technology which uh, uses Dart, which for me is basically JavaScript. Um, also, like, like the goal of how do we use JavaScript effectively, or JavaScript developers, because it's everybody, to build more applications in every ecosystem. So I think it's a good goal, but we're not there yet. It's a lot of challenges. Um, and that's the core of the, the talk today. Century can't fix any of this. So why am I up here speaking? Well, let's talk about what we think this is. There's a lot of ways you can articulate the software development lifecycle. This is how we think about it. Uh, you write the code somehow. You test the code, hopefully, somehow. You get it into production, and then you monitor it. You get feedback, or you learn from it, right? Sentry kind of owns that monitoring piece, or that's our agenda over time, right? Um, and we think about this specifically from the application lifecycle, right? I don't care about your servers, about your systems and your infrastructure and your machines over there. I care about the product and the, the actual business that you're building, right? And so that's how I think about this for them. And if you think about this, you also think a lot about the speakers today and how they connect to these things. So I wanna talk about each one a little bit. So the develop side, each one of these areas has a number of unique challenges. And so for me, the biggest thing that sticks out in like how do I write code is my development environment. Like how do I actually get it functioning so I can write code that maybe somewhat works? Um, you're gonna hear from April right after this. Uh, she's gonna talk about code spaces. That's one investment that helps this area. You know, we probably all use Docker uh, in infinite projects at this point. Docker's a huge influence. Again, not without its challenges. It's a lot of complexity to learn how Docker works and get all these things running. Um, so is it welcoming? Not really. Um, but there's a lot of investments around this, right? Gitpod is another one. Um, I know JetBrains has some stuff. There's a lot of this like kind of cloud-hosted development environment. But now you're in the cloud and you require internet connectivity to write code and all these other things. And so there's still challenges. We're like investing in technology, but we've not really gotten to this a place where there, there's a little bit too much compromise, I guess, today is what I would say. And I think we need to work on that. So moving forward on the test side. I actually think testing is where we've gotten the most advancement from an infrastructure point of view, but not a product point of view over the years. And so, personally, I'm a big fan of GitHub Actions. It solves a lot of problems for me. It just exists, it's affordable. We always use GitHub anyway, so it's great. It's there, right? So I've now got an, a, a capability to do CI. The user experience could use a little bit of work, though, right? As an example, which test is failing? There is no standard UI to see what tests are failing in a build, but every single one of us have builds because we have tests. Why is that such a problem today? I, I, I actually do not understand why people have not tackled this problem. Microsoft did it with Azure, with Azure DevOps. Their CI system reports test results, reports code coverage, things like this. But, and maybe it's because GitHub's newer, but most of these CI infrastructure tools 
this is not the out of the box approach they have. It's just to run dumb code and report green or red, right? And that to me is not tolerable. You know, there's a lot of other investments in the space. Um, we've got Eli here from CodeCub today. He's gonna talk about their point, of view, or their point of view on sort of what I think of as like code quality analytics, which are part of the CI pipeline. Uh, Circle CI is a big one, Travis CI. I think it's still a big one. We use it a lot in the open source days. But there's a lot of, again, investment in this area. But I think there's a long ways to go, particularly in the testing one. The release phase, which I think this is the area that is the most developed today. Uh, we'll go back to, like, we've got Guillermo here. We've got Divya from Fly, uh, James from Convex. All these companies kind of share this goal of, like, how do we make it easier to, like, get the code into production, to make it accessing data or your database or state in production? Now, I will say there's some challenges here that a lot of them have made it easy for JavaScript and not everything else. Um, and in fact, if you look at Fly versus Vercel, they're wildly different companies. Fly is kind of like, how do we enable a little bit more on the server side? I'm speaking for them, I might be wrong. Don't, don't claim I'm an expert in their pitch. Uh, Vercel is very much like, we're great at Next.js, we're gonna make it awesome to ship this layer of it. They do some other stuff, of course, too, but, but a lot of people are tackling this from different angles. They've done a really good job, and I think this is the most interesting because the goal of this is like production canary. Like, can I ship new code to a safe environment where it's guaranteed to work and have zero risk to my customers? And when you make the deploy very seamless, you can kind of do that. You can set it up so you can actually do a production canary, test your code in production, as they say, but not test it on customers in production, which is super critical. All right, moving on to Sentry. And I'm going to bleed over. I think we've got like 40 minutes slotted, so we're going. Um, Monitor, that's what Sentry does. Our goal is to solve this problem for you from an application developer lens. I'm not gonna talk much about this now, mostly because I refuse to pitch Sentry, um, but also Ian's gonna uh, shill, as he calls it, soon. Um, there's two important things I want you to take away. We're moving beyond errors. We already did that a little bit. We're not quite there yet, but we're moving drastically beyond errors very quickly. So you'll see a lot of that today. That's exciting, great, hang out, let's talk. We're also gonna aggressively invest in our workflow, in our issues concept, we're joining these two efforts, so beyond errors, but with this issues concept, because issues are effectively a, a tool we know and use. We use Jira for better or worse sometimes, uh, Linear, Asana, all these tools. They're all just ticket tracking. Sentry is just ticket tracking at the end of the day. And so we're really focused on that workflow because the workflow is what matters. I don't need more dashboards in my life. Um, but most importantly today, we're just here to create conversations. Like, Sentry can't fix this. We'll do our little part and our little slice of the world and hopefully we, we do it well enough. Um, but it is very much like a community effort. And I think you know the best thing I would have happened for this event today is just everybody talks to each other and we complain about everything we hate and we find a way to fix it. And so with that, um, I will hand it off, uh, I think to Sarah or to April and I will say if, if you wanna chat, I'll be around all day. I'm forced to stay here either way because I got to give a little chat with Guillermo later. But I'll be around probably up there if you want to talk Century or just talk about this. Um, love to hear what's on your mind. But otherwise, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the folks who made it in person. Uh, and hopefully you enjoy the rest of the speakers, hopefully more than me. Um, and thank you. <laughs>